Hallo Anbeter des chronologisch wertvollen Channels Zilli Gurke. Ähm, boah. Äh, ja, wir sind, wir sind wie immer auf Lasergurkenland und das ist wie immer ein Werbevideo. Bitte kommt auch auf den gratis erreichbaren Minecraft-Server Lasergurkenland. Erreichbar unter der IP sillihuhn.com. Äh, unter der Domain alternativ natürlich die IP hier äh, 149.202.127.134, je nachdem, was ihr lieber wollt. <lacht> Oder halt sillyhuhn.com. Äh, ja, wir schauen heute, wie schon gesagt, chronologisch wertvoller Channel, nachdem wir in den letzten Folgen Advanced Tor und Tor Next Generation Hidden Service hast du nicht gesehen gemacht haben. Kommt jetzt in dieser... F Hä? Ist das Teil gerade verschwunden? Äh, kommt es auf dieser, in dieser Folge von Aaron Jones Introduction to Tor. Also, ähm, ja. Und das ist äh, von dem Channel Brian Clough äh, mit äh, 2000 Abonnenten. Also keins dieser... Biester, die wir uns sonst immer pressen, wie Black Hat, Tor Project, Defcon Conference, ne? Sondern Brian Clough, habe ich noch nie von gehört, ist ein Video unter Creative Commons, wurde 2018 hochgeladen. Aaron Jones, Introduction to Tor, let's go! Mal sehen, was das so bringt. Ähm, Hallo, ja. Aaron Jones, und ich arbeite hier at the Chandler Police Department. I am an employee of the Chandler Police Department, but I am not representing the Chandler Police Department. Uh, I am also a member of the Phoenix Linux Users Group. In addition to that, I have a master's degree in intelligence analysis. Uh, I've been working in law enforcement and in military for close to a decade now, uh, if not a little bit more than. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I talk regularly. I do this Cybersecurity Meetup. A lot of you have been seeing me for more than a year now, and I thank you for all the regular faces that I see here in the crowd. So, what are we doing today? Performance objectives. Well, at the conclusion of this course, you, before you leave, will be able to identify what Tor is, identify one reason why you may wish to use Tor. You're going to be able to explain how Tor works, and in addition huh? to that, you're going to be able to explain how Tor begins. Wie ist das denn exploded? The, 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 war ich das gerade? Nein, das hat Of tour. Oh, fuck. So before we get into that, we need to talk about a few things that are very, very important right now. The first one's going to be FOSTA, which is the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Has everybody heard of this? Yes, a few of you, a few of you have not. That's okay, we will explain it. So, as per usual, the very first link that if you go to this and you open up the FOSTA bill, it will take you to congress.gov and you can read exactly what is in it. Okay, you can head over to this webpage, you can pull up this bill, and you can find out all the words that are inside of it, you can find out what actions have been taken, uh, you can find out all the co-sponsors, the committees that are in relation to this bill, uh, so House Energy and Commerce and then House Judiciary, and then we can also see related bills, which is very, very important here because many of these bills in order to get around some of the, the, the people who were upset about them, they went ahead and just pushed it off into the budget. And we'll see that here in a little bit as well. So this right here essentially kills Craigslist personal ads. Has everybody seen that? Craigslist no longer has their like adult personal ads anymore. They just went ahead and took those off. Uh, in addition to that, can anybody give me the name no, of another Leute. place? That is no longer online. Ich muss kurz hier ein bisschen zurückspulen, weil irgendwie waren wir gerade zu viel Action. Ich habe den Stop Anschluss verloren. Uh, many of these bills, in order to get around some of the, the, the people who were upset about them, they went ahead and just pushed it off into the budget. And we'll see that here in a little bit as well. So this right here ja, wo kann ich denn die kills Craigslist personal ads. Oh. So, as per usual, the very first link that if you go to this and you open up the FOSTA bill, 
it will take you to congress.gov and you can read exactly what is in it. Okay, you can head over to this webpage, you can pull up this bill, and you can find out all the words that are inside of it, you can find out what actions have been taken, uh, you can find out all the co-sponsors, the committees that are in relation to this bill, uh, so House Energy and Commerce and then House Judiciary, and then we can also see related bills, which is very, very important here because many of these bills, in order to get around some of the, uh, the people who were upset about them, they went ahead and just pushed it off into the budget, and we'll see that here in a little bit as well. So this right here essentially kills Craigslist's personal ads. Has everybody seen that? Craigslist no longer has their like adult personal ads anymore. They just went ahead and took those off. Uh, in addition to that, can anybody give me the name of another place that is no longer online? They just got these. I can think of it, but I can't name it. Backpage. Back page. Back, yeah, back page. So back page is completely gone. They've been seized. If you try to go to the back page web page, it actually comes up with one of those really nifty like FBI seizure pictures with all the emblems and everything on it. Uh, now, for those of you who are wondering, FOSTA didn't pass before Backpage went down. Okay, so keep that in mind. FOSTA hadn't become law yet before they took down Backpage. Therefore, anybody who tells you that Okay, Leute, Backpage ich muss noch mal, ich muss noch mal zurück. Äh, das ist ja. Also jetzt sind wir auf dem Wasser. Jetzt höre ich mal zu. Das tut mir leid. Das für ein sketchy redirect link. Okay, gut. Keine Angst, ich spiele nicht nochmal zurück. Ich will nur, äh, nur mal klarstellen. Der hat einfach die ganze Zeit nie wirklich erklärt, was das ist. Oder? Also, oder trippe ich jetzt? Und ich dachte, er hat irgendwelche Sachen vorgelesen, die, die erklären, wie so Craigslist nicht mehr funktioniert. Aber anscheinend hat er nur gezeigt, wo man dieses Hoster findet, dieses Fight Online Sex Traffic. Und ähm, genau, ich glaube, die Erklärung kommt jetzt erst longer has their like adult personal ads anymore they just went ahead and took those off uh, in addition to that can anybody give me the name of another place that is no longer online ich habe von diesem Foster noch nie gehört wann ist denn das 2018 ich kann nicht sagen aber ich kann nicht sagen Backpage 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 so Backpage is completely gone they've been seized 
If you try to go to the back page web page, it actually comes up with one of those back really page, good, like, you, yeah. FBI seizure pictures with all the emblems and everything on it. Uh, now, for those of you who are wondering, FOSTA didn't pass what? before Backpage went down. Okay, so keep that in mind. FOSTA hadn't become law yet before they took down Backpage. Therefore, anybody who tells you that Backpage is down because of FOSTA, that's not true. They were able to take them down without using FOSTA. However, FOSTA is going to be a part of this case. Okay? So what is it in relation to? Well, the thing that they're worried about is any web page that's promoting prostitution or sex trafficking can now be held responsible for the content within. This is a really, really big change. For over all the years that we have had the ability to say and do pretty much anything that we want on a web page without somebody being held responsible for it, this is a massive change for this, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is going to be selectively enforced. There's a whole bunch of people who have gotten up and said, well, this is going to stop me from being able to uh, warn people about different practices that are uh, involved in sex trafficking and so on and so forth. Uh, this is targeting people like the owner of Backpage. Now, let me explain what happened with Backpage and why they're in so much trouble and why the owner of Backpage is actually being charged with pimping. Okay? That's the actual charge that he got picked up for was pimping. Well, one of them, yes, but it's the main one. The, the main one that they're going to try to get him, I think, on 20 years for is pimping. Um, so he creates Backpage, and he has a section which is the adult uh, advertisement section, and they were pulling in anywhere from tens to hundreds of millions of dollars off of that section. Okay, depends on who you ask and who you're talking to. It's anywhere from the tens to the hundreds of millions of dollars that were being pulled in specifically from people who were advertising for sexual, uh, I'm going to use the word stuff, okay? Sexual things, business, yes, sex-related businesses. So FBI agents created accounts. They purchased advertising. They contacted him, and they made it clear multiple times, hi, my name's so-and-so. I'm a victim of sex trafficking, and I need to give you money so that I can post advertisements on your page so that I can sell my body, or I'm going to be beaten by my pen for so on and so forth. And the individuals accepted the money. And they became more and more blatant with what they were telling this person and saying uh, things that could be outpolled in court. Okay, So they could use this stuff in court. And eventually, the FBI said, okay, they know that these people are being trafficked. They know that they're victims. They know that these things are occurring. But not only that, trafficked. they're accepting money and they're facilitating. So That's people who are having issues with their accounts uh, and would admit, yes, I'm being trafficked, or yes, I'm a prostitute, or yes, so on and so forth. Even so though all of that was in the email, they were still providing support for them to make sure that their accounts functioned so that they could continue to become victims or be victimized. Uh, after all of this had occurred over several years, several investigations, so on and so forth, apparently now they finally have enough evidence that it started to stick. So as soon as the guy got back, I believe from Denmark, they went ahead and executed arrests, they served, uh, served search warrants, they captured servers, so on and so forth. <sighs> Uh, picked all this stuff up, and now the guy is facing 20 years with the main charge of pimping. Many of them who have been arrested right now are already pleading out. So they've already said, you know what, we'll just plead guilty, just we'll take lesser sentences. Now, some news outlets are claiming that if you're LGBT, this is going to unfairly target you in particular, or... Uh, any number of other things that they're saying. I don't like the fact that they're passing this law. I don't like the law. Everybody knows kind of how I am about this stuff. However, you can't facilitate pimping, drugs, narcotics, any of these things from your home. You can't facilitate them from the newspaper. There's an endless supply of places where you can do these things that they will investigate you. Uh, your web page is no different. 
And it's not like this is setting any kind of new precedent either. I mean, they went after what? The Silk Road? So the Silk Road existed. That was a place where people were buying and selling drugs. And in addition to that, uh, any number of other services, including prostitution, well, they were investigated and that place was shut down. So this isn't different, but I think the fact that this is a little bit more high profile and a little bit more open, having been on the open net for so long, this is becoming a much bigger deal. Now on here, there is a link to a television show called The Computer Chronicles, which this was recorded in about 1980 something. Uh, 1985, 1986, right around in there, where they're discussing things like BBSs and modems. And now, if you were to click on this, it will take you to YouTube and it will take you to the direct oh, part scheiß. of the show where they talk say. about a BBS owner sitting there right next to an assistant district attorney and they're arguing whether or not that BBS owner is responsible for what's posted on his BBS. Now, people were posting child pornography on his BBS. People were posting BBS. advertisements for uh, prostitution. They were posting all kinds of things that we would be familiar with today, all the way back then, on this guy's dial-up BBS. And here's the district attorney arguing that he should be held responsible for it, while he sits there and argues that he should not be held responsible for it. Now, for many years, uh, it was very common for people to not be held responsible. That was sort of uh, upheld, but always argued. And so this is not a new argument. Nothing here that we're discussing within this bill, and nothing that's happening here, isn't something that hasn't happened all the way back in the beginning of time, okay? So, the question is, should an administrator be held responsible for the discussions held on their board? Is your BBS or your webpage like a newspaper with First Amendment rights, or is it like a utility that is subject to regulation? Those questions were posed then, and now they're posed today. However, the laws are turning against those of us who administer web pages, those of us who administer oh my God, uh, no BBSs. I still run a BBS. So, whoa, whoa, uh, I don't get a lot of traffic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But, if you can get on there and say something terrible or bad or whatever, and maybe I could get in trouble for it. I want you all to do a little research, find out what's going on with these things, and also look at the historical arguments that were posed, and just try to, to find out for yourself which way we should be headed. Uh, obviously, I'm a big free speech proponent. I'm real big on, uh, you know, don't punish the masses, punish the criminals, and so on and so forth. Like, we shouldn't all be held responsible for the, the, the bad works of a very small few. But... But Everybody here needs to figure out that skill. this is not a new argument. This is something that's been going on for a long time, and it's finally coming to fruition for those of who oh want my. to take away your ability to say things that you want to be able to say online. Next one is the Cloud Act, and this one's real important because this has to do with Microsoft and some of the stuff that's going on with them right now. Uh, Microsoft has been in court for a very, very long while, and what they've been in court for is they have stated very clearly that uh, if you have data and it is on Microsoft servers, well, it is a possibility that that data could be held in a foreign country. And if it is, they can't give it to US law enforcement. They can't give it to uh, intelligence agencies over here. They can't give that information to a, us. I'm gonna use the word us uh, because of the fact that it's held over there and it's not beholden to our laws. So, this Cloud Act, which, again, if you click on it, it takes you right to congress.gov, you can read it, so you all can see, I want to make sure that everybody knows that don't just take my word for it, make sure that you're going out and you're reading all this stuff so you can better understand it. They went ahead and just put that in the budget. Instead of having to sit there and vote on it and do all of that stuff, they added it to the budget. It got passed. The budget went through. So now we're under the Cloud Act. Uh, there was a lawsuit between the government and Microsoft in which the government said, hey, Microsoft, you have to give us that data. And Microsoft said, no, we don't. And well, now the court 
within a few days of the Cloud Act passing, went ahead and just dropped that case and said, oh, we don't have to have this case anymore, because guess what? The Cloud Act says you have to give up that data. All right? Now, I have sat down and I have spoken to members of law enforcement who are on both sides of the fence on this. Okay? I have talked to investigators who work on child pornography cases, who investigate these kind of crimes, that by having had this passed, they expect several cases to go from being open to closed and, and solved very, very quickly because this has changed, okay? However, this is a loophole. This is a loophole that was created that bypasses all of our rights and protections for our data and our privacy to be able to hand it off, okay? So now, when the government goes to Microsoft and says, uh, give us your information on such and such person. Well, now Microsoft has to pony up. Uh, they can't just say, well, that information is held in a foreign country or it's overseas or so on and so forth. In addition to that, we will now be able to work openly with foreign intelligence services. Before, the idea of working with a foreign intelligence service to be able to gather information and data from overseas and bring it into the U.S. or to gather information on U.S. citizens was considered sort of this foreign, like, oh, this is so weird. Like, we don't do this. And I'll show you evidence of that further down. I have some videos for you all to watch uh, where they discuss this uh, in relation to the Lockerbie bombing. Now, the Lockerbie bombing is kind of old. Like, it's from a long time ago. Some of us will remember Lockerbie. Some of us will not. But one of the big scandals was that uh, after the Lockerbie bombing, British intelligence gave information on people who were doing Freedom of Information Act requests to U.S. intelligence and allowed them to investigate. Okay? So we made a deal that Britain would give us information on people who were doing their own uh, lookups on what was going on, and we would investigate them and then pass that information back to British intelligence. Huge scandal. It was a big deal. That, after this Cloud Act, no longer a problem. Okay? So now, law enforcement can open cases and pursue prosecution based on data provided by foreign services legally. So I mentioned the Trump dossier in here, whereas it was a considered a um, uh, sort of a scandal that, oh, we received information from this foreign intelligence agency who passed U.S. intelligence information on a U.S. citizen, and this is a big problem, and so on and so forth, and they started an investigation about it. Well, now, after this, that's no longer an issue for them to be able to do that. So foreign agencies can now provide us information on US citizens and we can use that for investigation. That's the, that's the, the, the end of it right there. And again, I give you a link so that you can see Microsoft, they're in court right now. Uh, the Department of Justice has already asked the Supreme Court to drop the Microsoft case. It's already been dropped. There's a ton of information here. You really ought to take the time to look into this stuff because it's very, very important. And it's relevant to our uses of Freenet, of IPT. Okay? This is what's happening on what amounts to the clear net, the open net. Uh, and if we're the Kühe, investigating these tool sets that are supposed to keep us private, es ist not allow schön people hier. to track what oh we're doing online, ich, what ich we're saying, mich hier or how we're behaving. Uh, it's only a matter of time before they start using this to be able to investigate servers all over. And we'll get to that a little bit further. One more thing that I want to leave you with before we get into tour proper is going to be protest fatigue. So SOPA, BOSTA, Cloud. <coughs> and you'll see that I was working on this before Immer Cloud passed. Selbe. Because I do mention that Cloud is an inevitability will lose on the cloud bill, like it's going to happen. There was no huge outrage, no, you know, massive turnout from Reddit, from 8chan, from all the different web pages that were supposed to come together and tell everybody, like, oh, we should be fighting cloud. Well, they've spent tons and tons of money on just SOPA. They did all the advertising. They did the, the digital sit-ins. They did all of these things, and you start hitting into protest fatigue. Because somebody can take that bill and they can filing it with a different name until people are so tired they just can't fight it anymore. 
So we have this endless number of bills mm -hmm. that are each running back to back, working towards trying to take away your rights, to remove your ability to have a private conversation. Uh, and we're running out of money, we're running out of attention, and we're running out of outrage. People get beat down. It just, it happens. And we're losing these battles. So network neutrality, that's a loss. You lost that. FOSTA will be a loss. It is now. That, now, right now, it is a loss. But at the time I was writing this, I knew it was an inevitability. And then we will lose on the cloud bill. Well, guess what? We did. They just moved it into the House Appropriations Bill, became part of spending, and it passed. So what do we do next? I'm going to leave that to you all. Think about it. What can we do? Can you stay outraged? Can you stay mad forever? Can you keep fighting it? I don't know. I'd like to think so, but there will always be somebody who gets up and decides to spend their Thursday night either sitting down and listening to this stuff or getting up and talking about it, but I don't know. So, let's get to the tour project. Questions to the end, man. Write it down. We're going to have a couple empty Senate seats to uh, fill in the next couple of years, so uh, you might want to think about having an impact early in the primary season. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Was that like a, I should run for Congress kind of thing? Mm. Run for Senate? <laughs> I'm, I'm not recommending one way or the other. I'm just noticing that uh, there are perhaps people already planning to do Good. So this is Tor, and this is the Tor webpage. Tor is pretty popular, and most people already know about Tor, but we're not going to just talk about the, the outer shell. Tor. We're going to get into some of the more nitty-gritty parts. Now, Tor likes to tout that they protect your privacy, uh, they can help you defend yourself against network surveillance, mm. and uh, they help stop traffic analysis. Mm. Which, in some ways they do, and in general, the use of Tor can provide mm. some levels of protection. I'm going to interrupt that thought right now. Uh, story time on what happens if you use Tor, but nobody else is using it. So out here, college, nameless, not going to name the college, uh, it was time for finals, and everybody had to go do their testing. So one of the gentlemen who had gone for finals decided to sit down and jump on the internet using Tor and send a message through one of those uh, text-to-speech death phone call systems and said, uh, I've got a bomb planted, it's going to blow up in the school, blah, 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 everybody's going to die, just set this whole place on fire. And then as soon as he was done with that, Oh, I think from the fall I've heard. Okay. Now, for those of you who are in the audience, can yeah, anybody tell me what his biggest mistake was? Time frame. Yeah, and getting out of it. Time frame. So he didn't have Tor on, and then he turned it on, he did his business, and then he turned it off. So now he set a timestamp. There's an empty spot, kind of like taking scissors and cutting it out of that little time space. And there's a great big old empty spot. So the school, of course, being scared, picks up the phone, calls in the FBI, calls in the SWAT team, calls in everybody, and says, we just got this huge threat. This is a terrible thing. Everybody's going to die. So everybody rolls out with all their equipment and their gear shows up, immediately looks at the logs, and they see from, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock, you know, 10.02 a.m., there's this small chunk of time in which somebody was on tour, and he was the only tour user on the entire network. He was the only person that was there during that small period of time, and he had called in a threat. But they didn't see the threat part, so what do they do? They go, they knock on the door, the guy opens up the door, and they say, we know that you called in the threat, we know it's you, blah, blah, blah. Was it you? And he immediately breaks down. Yeah, I called it in, I didn't want to take my final. Scared of it wasn't the pass. So he immediately admitted to what he did, because A, he'd done it, B, he was scared of all the people with guns and body armor and stuff that showed up at his door, and C, he had left a giant trail of breadcrumbs for everybody to follow right back to his dorm room. Tor can provide you 
some level of privacy. Tor does not make you invisible. Freenet doesn't make you invisible, okay? In addition to that, I2P does not make you invisible. You can use any of these tools, but you will always leave. Now there's an M word here, metadata. Now we've talked about metadata in here before when I was talking about some of the intelligence analysis stuff that we do, but there's that data that isn't the core data, it's that supporting and surrounding data that you can still use to build the picture. It's kind of like having a jigsaw puzzle with some of the pieces in the middle pulled out, but there's still enough information for you to be able to figure out what that picture is. Does that make sense? You can build the frame, but you don't have to have, you know, the picture of Cassius Clay's face to know, oh, that's Muhammad Ali right there, but you can see that pose. Okay. So they allege, and I use the term allege not in a negative context. I use it just like any other law enforcement related person would use. They allege that they provide protection to journalists, activists, business people, the military, and others. Okay. Tor encrypts their traffic and bundles it through a method known as onion routing before passing on this bundle of information between nodes on the way to the destination. Now, big difference here, we talked about garlic routing with I2P, right? And now we're talking about onion routing here. The idea being with garlic routing, you have several different layers of communication for several different people, whereas with onion routing, that communication is only for one sole user. So you have one onion, but with garlic routing, you can carry the information for multiple users. Therefore, it is supposed to make it more difficult for somebody to be able to track back the traffic when doing garlic routing over doing onion routing. So you can use Tor to communicate internally to the Tor network itself with dot onion sites. They would all be internal to the system. Or you can use the power of an exit node to access information found on the clear net. Everybody understands the concept behind the clear net? Clear net being just any web page that's out on the internet that is not part of the Tor network, the Freenet, or uh, I2P, okay? So Google.com, that's ClearNet. Now, Tor recommends the use of their Tor browser, and that's a tool developed with a base in the Firefox web browser that is recommended for ease of access and use. Oh boy, I'm gonna get into Firefox here. And y'all know that I have a real low opinion of Firefox. Mm -hmm. So I do not trust Firefox, and I do not trust the Tor browser. Okay. That's me. Here is a small list of vulnerabilities mm. for Firefox. Okay. We're looking at approximately 190 current vulnerabilities right here. Uh, tons and tons, over 7.5 in terms of you know how dangerous they are. CVE is a great place to go to start doing research before you start to do anything in terms of penetration testing, learning about different software, anything like that. Go find out what the giants have done and then go stand on their shoulders. And this is where you can do that. People are doing the penetration testing for you and now you can go back and you can look and find out, you know, what kind of vulnerabilities are there? What versions are affected? What kinds of things are people finding? In addition to that, just for those of you who don't have that mindset, keep in mind that just because they claim that one of these CVEs have been resolved or fixed doesn't necessarily mean that they have not created a new vulnerability. And sometimes it pays to go back and look at something that they have claimed to have fixed in order to locate new problems. You know, they, they can implement something to fix an issue that then opens up brand new holes. So keep that in mind, okay? So, tons and tons of active exploits, tons and tons of problems, tons of issues, okay? Tools like the Tor browser will continue to be vulnerable, full stop, no matter what. I don't care what browser you pick, I don't care what system you're using, if you're connected to the internet, you're making a hole somewhere, all right? Now, in fairness, everybody knows that I love Elinks. Elinks is my, that's my buddy right there. I use eLinks all day, and I use eLinks with uh, Freenet. So I'm going to throw Freenet. up. We've got some CVEs for, free, uh, for uh, eLinks. All seven of them. All seven vulnerabilities that are found inside of eLinks. I put them up there. 
So if you guys want to break into E-Links, please do. Because I'd love to find out if there are any more problems and get those problems fixed. Have you ever used E-Links? Yes. I use Links for uh, Gopher. So Links comes pre-built with Gopher Protocol, whereas E-Links you have to build from source to get Gopher Protocol. So I Just use uh, Links specifically for Gopher. Everybody know what Gopher is? No. No? A little bit? Okay. So Gopher Protocol, I'm just gonna, we'll segue into Gopher Protocol real quick because that's my favorite thing in the whole wide world. Gopher Protocol was a protocol that existed before HTTP. So before you could go to the web, they had Gopher Protocol. And every single Gopher web page looks essentially the same and it's easily surfed with your number keys. Because you can simply go to link one, link two, link three, so on and so forth. Where HTTP one out was on the ability to track users the ability to uh, transfer information between the browser and the user and then back to the server and back and forth. Gopher is not really built like that. Gopher is sort of a one-way track of information. I have information on my server. You want it, you can pull it down off of my server. It's much more secure because you can't push. You can't push to my server. Uh, now, there are ways to push to Gopher, especially nowadays. They sort of made that a little bit easier, but uh, I also don't like that either. Your browser, and we've talked about this before, and we'll talk about it again. Your browser sucks. My browser sucks. Everybody's browser sucks. There's tons of problems. Can anybody here tell me, starts with a J, what is the worst part of modern day browsers? JavaScript. 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 Most of your vulnerabilities that you're going to find in Firefox in the Tor browser and in some of the vulnerabilities that we'll talk about down below, JavaScript. It's somebody using JavaScript to be able to attack the browser and then from there de anonymize the user. Now, and we'll talk about this again in a little bit, but Firefox, or I'm sorry, the Tor browser does not disable JavaScript by default, what? which is what has caught up a lot of people. A lot of people surf web pages, and they go to these web pages, and their JavaScript is turned on, and they get popped. So that's essentially your number one vulnerability here. And I'm going to be fair here, and I'm going to tell you, that's not Tor's fault. Okay, the Tor protocol is fairly sound. When you're attacking a system by targeting the web browser, that is completely different than targeting the system because you're able to actually attack the protocol. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? So I'm not saying that Tor is a, a bad system in and of itself, or that the Tor protocol is bad or anything like that. It's the supporting software that surrounds Tor that I disagree with and I have a problem with. So, GitHub, it is. Well, this is actually GitWeb. So this is where Tor does their development, and you can come here and you can start viewing the Tor commits, you can see what code is being written, you can see who's committing to it. I've told you all this before, I'll tell you all again. If you're going to use software like this, please review the source code. It's no more than to go and look at who is developing on it and get a feel for who actually pushes code. Because that could be the difference between you identifying somebody doing something malicious with the system or not knowing who's working on the system. Familiarize yourself with the coders at the bare minimum. Even if you can't read the code itself yet, it's also good practice so you can start familiarizing yourself with it. Especially for those of you who are my students, uh, start learning to familiarize yourself with other people's code. Because guess what? When you get out into the real world, a lot of what you'll be doing is supporting other people's code. Yeah, developers read code, they don't write it most of the time. They also have a GitHub. You can head there. Uh, some of it is active, some of it is not. So they have GitHub. I've added links there, you can head there as well. <laughs> GitHub fanboy. <clears throat> Next thing that you're wanna, going to want to do, do not run an exit, no. is get yourself the installer. There's totally a million different ways of doing it. Uh, if you're on Ubuntu, they have some PPAs. Mm -hmm. They do warn you if you're using Ubuntu or Debian not to use the Tor that is made available. Uh, directly within the repositories that are stock. You need to add their PPAs because those stock ones are usually behind. They're uh, uh, several versions behind. 
Yeah, Debian. <laughs> if you're using something like Manjaro or Arch, uh, you can get uh, you can get Tor through Yaourt. So that's a, a really easy way of doing it. And then once you've done that, you can open it and then open the Tor browser. Super simple, super easy. In addition to that, I'd like to give you two alternatives. Both of these use Docker. So you can either proxy all of your content through Docker and send it through Proboxy, uh, which is one way of doing it. And then another group has a way of doing it so that you can send it through their own uh, proxy and using uh, IP tables. And then in addition to that, uh, you can always just run the browser natively. Now, everybody knows that like Freenet and I2P, I run those on a server that has nothing to do with my house. I push those out to a foreign server and then I connect to that foreign server just to move my traffic outside of my computer and normally I do it through SSH tunnels. Now you can see how I do that in previous talks on I2P and in uh, Freenet. So if you would like to do that, you can do that also with Tor. You can set up a Docker machine overseas, you can set up the Provoxy, and then you can use an SSH tunnel to move all your traffic Provoxy. from here out to that system and then push it up into Tor and then out into the internet if you were interested in doing that. Uh, I don't install these things on a local machine. I just don't. I don't keep them on a local machine. I keep them off site and I keep them in a foreign country because it's just one more step. Now, obviously, those steps are getting much shorter and much smaller. Yeah, and über diese foreign countries now. and the machine, da, wie viel Kontrolle hat er über die und wie viel Vertrauen hat er in die Hoste? So, those steps that I had created are getting much, much smaller. But there's one more thing that you can add because it's a language barrier. In France. How many people do you know speak French? Some, but one more layer. And also, there's a ton of people in France who speak English because I actually work with those guys pretty regularly out in France on server stuff, and their English is great. So that's also not a barrier. Does the European uh, privacy rules good question because we don't know yet. So for those of you who don't know, Europe has a very, very strict set of privacy laws, uh, both within the European Union and then within Germany and then like Britain. All of these different groups have very, very, very strict privacy laws, extremely strict, uh, to the point where several companies, including like Apple and others, are being sued for tens of trillions of billions of dollars that are undoubtedly going to be reduced into some kind of manageable fund for that company that would be incredibly a giant windfall for us if we were to ever get that money. But going off of that, uh, here I'm going to give you a prediction that may or may not come to fruition, but what I think that we're going to eventually have is country segregated servers to where if you live in China, all of your servers will be in China and you will be, hold, be beholden to Chinese law and you won't be able to use servers outside of China. If you're in the European Union, same. And if you are in the United States, same. I think eventually we will move to the point that because of the vast differences in laws, that they're going to just decide one day. Americans have to stay with Americans, Europeans with Europeans, because you can't be in the middle on these privacy laws. And that's how that's going to end up functioning. And I'm thinking that's probably going to end up happening within five to 10 years, just on account of the fact that our Anti-privacy stuff is so divergent from the way that things are in Europe. The amount of fines that people like Microsoft and Apple are going to get popped with for mistakes that they're going to make, it's not going to be worth it. It'll be a better idea for them to just keep things separate. In addition to that, if you don't know this, but Apple is moving a whole ton of servers into China in order to meet their laws right now. So for Apple to be able to do business in China, they move the servers into China and give them the SSH keys and all the security keys to the Chinese so that they can go through that server whenever they want. What? So keep that in mind. What the fuck? So back to Tor. If you are a
are a Tor user and you're using Tor from your home, the FBI has you want to watch this. For real reels, not for play plays. Like that's oh, das habe ich gerade schon in einem anderen Talk same gehört. Word. They actually have a watch list that will pop up eventually and your ISP will report you and they will say, hey, this person is using Tor from their home and then eventually they'll put you on a list of people that they need to keep an eye on. No different than if you were a member of Linux Journal and you owned a copy of Linux Journal. Well, guess what? You were on an FBI watch list. And that's in their documentation that was used by Edward Snowden and all of them. So we have, we have the paperwork that says that they're doing this. Here's a news article on it from the register. They can issue a warrant to monitor you, to monitor your traffic, tap your phone lines, do whatever it is that they want to do if you're using Tor. Okay? Tor is an indicator. Tor exists as an indicator of criminal activity. Bar none. Okay? That's it. If you're using Tor and you're using it from your house, you're being watched. Guess what? I'm probably on a ton of lists. Like a whole ton of lists. Because I've been doing I2P and Freenet and Tor and I've been writing all this stuff and investigating all kinds of things and typing crazy stuff into Google and DuckDuckGo and all these different places all day, I am shocked that somebody hasn't come and knocked on my door yet. But I guess we'll see. How do they justify probable cause? So funny you would ask, because that's the actual text right there. Yeah, I can actually read this to you, though. So authority to issue a warrant. At the request of a federal law enforcement officer or an attorney for the government, a magistrate judge with authority in any district where activities related to a crime may have occurred, guess what? Crimes occur every day. Okay? So anywhere crime may have occurred has authority to issue a warrant to use remote access to search electronic storage media and to seize or copy electronically stored information located within or outside that district. If the district where the media or information is located has been concealed through technological means, TOR, I2P, Freenet, okay? Or in an investigation of a violation of their code, the media are protected computers that have been damaged without authorization and are located in five or more districts. So if you've got a cloud and somebody breaks into your cloud, well now the FBI can go break into your cloud too to go start an investigation. If you are using TOR, they are authorized to ask for a warrant and then break into your home computer. Okay? And there's the text right there. There's, there's a breakdown of what they can do. Now, sadly, we can't watch videos here. I would love to be able to play this video for you. Okay, Leute. Um, ja, das war's mit dieser Episode. Das war ein, aber das ist noch ein Talk, wir sind jetzt in der Hälfte durch, wir schauen in der nächsten Folge weiter, von Aaron Jones, Introduction to Tor auf dem Channel Brian Clough. Wir spielen hier auf dem gratis erreichbaren Microsoft Server, Anarchie Microsoft Server, Laser Gurken nennt mit der P129.202.1.7.134 oder eben sillyhoon.com. Genau, äh, alles klar, dann ähm, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Episode.